Hello, hello, everyone. I am Antoine Hunter, Purple, also known as Purple Fire Crow. Welcome to Deaf Woke. I'm your host. I'm really excited uh, for today's event. Today, today, August 26, 2021, we're here. Oh, I gotta let y'all know, man, I'm still recovering from the Bay Area International Deaf Dance Festival. Woo, I'm tired. But ah, that means that doesn't mean I, I can stop. I gotta keep it going. I thoroughly enjoy meeting various types of people. Learning from their culture you know, cultures within deaf culture. I feel like, uh, you know, connecting, you know, with those people, it's like new family members. It, it's like, just, it's warm, uh, it's powerful. Uh, my mind is still growing, you know? And I wish the world can experience that every, every every day in life. You know, for example, just going to meet somebody. You know, uh, meeting deaf leaders that own their own business. Uh, it's, it, it's incredibly inspiring for me. Now, before we start our show, I want to introduce uh, our two beautiful interpreters. Oh, oh, oh! Well, hello, you. Hello. This is Jay, and good to see you, Kaylee. Y'all doing all right? Kaylee says, "Yeah, yeah." Okay, woo, 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 all right. I hope you all have a good time with us today. Thank you for being here. And now onto our fabulous guest. Let me give you a little information about her. Our guest for this evening is Aletha Lindsay, A-L-E-A-T-H-A, -A -A, last name L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Uh, Lindsay is a Atlanta-based award-winning multidisciplinary artist, independent curator, disability advocate, and published author. She is a graduate of Georgia State University Russell Sage College, as well as the Savannah College of Arts and Design, where she holds a Master's of Arts in Creative Business Leadership. She's trained in classical ballet. She's appeared in films and theater productions. She also studied dance movement therapy in Koruf, uh, Greece. After completing her studies, she went on to pursue post uh, in the mental health, arts, community development, and special uh, education arenas. She's been deaf uh, at the age of two. She credits her early exposure to the arts with helping her overcome the challenges related to her disability. Her work has been purchased by collectors nationally and exhibited in Atlanta, New York, Spain, Morocco, and Norway. Lindsay is the founder and curator 
of the Ikui, I-K-O-U-I-I, creative. An organization that supports artists with disabilities globally and assists organizations in adopting more inclusive attitudes. The Ikui Creative serves artists worldwide in countries including the United States, Canada, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, Israel, India. The organization offers diverse spectrum of exhibits, events, and programs to amplify its impact in the arts sector. Whew. Please welcome Alia Lindsay. Come on on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hi. Hey. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to see you. <laughs> Likewise. So my first question, man, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> I'm great. I'm great. It's been a busy week, but I'm great. <laughs> Well, busy doing what? Oh, oh, so many different projects and we're getting ready for our, our next ex exhibition and um, editing book. I'm just, it's just been crazy busy with a lot of projects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to your book. Okay. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about it. Okay. Well, um, the iQui book project, um, I started it through the organization um, in 2019, the iQui book project. Um, the mission of the project was basically to reiterate one of our values that uh, people of differently able uh, individual artists can um, be an integral part of the arts has you know art professionals um, artists uh, performers um, patrons art collectors so um, I thought what better way to educate people by putting it in a book? And so uh, the first edition came out last year. And so we highlighted 30 individuals from all over the world, uh, 13 countries. Um, some of the artists uh, that were um, uh, highlighted in the book are actually deaf. And um, I just wanted to highlight different people who were doing different things and educate about the need of uh, access and diversity and being inclusive. And I'm I'm just excited to work on the second edition. And hopefully I can get Mr. Hunter in the second edition. <laughs> hopefully. But yeah, the book is doing great. And it's been um it's been sold in 15 countries. Uh, it's in libraries all across uh, the U.S. It's in the collection at Gallaudet University at RIT. It's, it's amazing. So I'm ready to get into that second edition. What was it like uh, growing up in Georgia? Oh, oh, um, 
great. I had a great upbringing. Um, I was homeschooled from a young age due to uh, being deaf, actually. Um, they were telling my mom that I wouldn't pass uh, the third, fourth grade level. And she was just like, <laughs> forget that. And so she took me out of school, homeschooled me. Mm -hmm. And um, I graduated, obviously, I have three degrees. <laughs> so, yeah. And being homeschooled actually um, allowed me to pursue creative endeavors. So I spent a small amount of time in school, but uh, I got into painting I started going to ballet from a young age. And, you know, I was just really immersed into the creative uh, activities. So that's how, um, yeah, that's how my upbringing was. <laughs> that's right. You just decided to prove people wrong. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I love education. I love people telling me that I can't do this. I can't do that. Because I'm going to get out there and show them I can do it. Exactly. Sometimes, though, it gets a little tiring. So what do you do to keep your energy, your motivation going? <laughs> um, wow. I think that what motivates me is just the passion, the desire to, um, you know, do what I do. I love what I do. So that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps my energy going. As long as you love what you do, I mean, you will find the energy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I'm, I concur. You know, uh, doing what you love doing. That's how you get that energy. It's a transferable uh, transaction, you know? Correct. So you have three <laughs> degrees? In what? Um, well, I originally wanted to be a creative art therapist. I, I'm still passionate about that, but um, I eventually wanted to work in museums and uh, work in art uh, organizations in a leadership role so that I can, you know, create programs and, and do, uh, you know, my lifetime mission is to be inclusive and diverse. And uh, so that was the way that I can do it. So my first degree is in fine art. And then I went and pursued a creative art therapy degree. And then the third degree is my graduate degree in creative business design and leadership. So it kind of like, it's a full circle kind of thing. Can you tell me more about the dance movement therapy that you were describing? The dance movement therapy, well, I think it was just a progression from starting classical ballet training from a very young age. And so uh, it was ingrained in me to be a dancer. I was a dancer all along. That's all I knew for a while. And so I did that for 15 years. I started to do modern dance, jazz, and that type of thing. And so when I pursued my degree in creative art therapy, 
which was dance movements, art visual therapy, music therapy, all that stuff. It was just so exciting. And so, um, yeah, at one point I was going to be a dance movement therapist, but you know how life is. You, <laughs> your plans change. And so, yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, you know, did it, is, do you believe that people should attend something like that dance therapy, that, that it could be uh, tr inspiring? Absolutely. It, you know, what did you learn? What did you learn about that transition from what you were starting to where you are? Um, hold on. <laughs> um, well, I, before I had been a performer and so dance movement therapy is uh, about tapping into the inner person and it's about healing and, uh, recognizing, uh, dramas and uh, the different things that we go through in life. And so it's interesting to work with people doing the dance movement therapy and seeing how um, they address things about themselves and they learn new things and they uh, experience healing and some awoke moments of realization through dance and movement. So it's not about performing, it's about um, working on your internal. <laughs> it's some deep stuff. Yeah. 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 So in my training, I work with a lot of people, you know, um, the elderly, um, children, uh, people with uh, differently abled abilities and so it was amazing to see when they go through this um, dance movement therapy, how they um, make a progression um, and it changes a person. It's not easy. But wow. You know, learning that it's more, especially being deaf, especially being a person of color, we really need, I mean, all humans need to da need dance therapy. You know, speaking of uh, deaf people, my understanding is you were, you recognize that you were deaf at age two? Yeah, right at age two is when you were identified. Yeah, um, I lost. Yeah, I lost my hearing at around that age, and um, it's interesting because I didn't have any idea of disability or that I couldn't do things until probably college. That's when I started getting um, experiences where I felt limited, and um, I think being homeschooled. I didn't really experience a lot of um, access issues. I mean, even in um, dance, uh, when I was doing um, ballet, my ballet teachers were very um, conscious of making sure that I was um, following the music and making sure that they, you know, put in an effort to make sure that I understood uh, the class and uh, the steps and whatnot. So I didn't really experience uh, like feeling like, oh, I am disabled or anything until I got into college. And then there was access issues and um, discrimination and that type of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, were you involved uh, with the deaf community, deaf culture, uh, 
the hearing community, with the, the disability community, the black culture. I said, you know, I realized that we had mentioned that you are a strong advocate. Yes, yes, yes. You are working. You know, making sure people have, understand their rights, uh, supporting uh, because of your experience. You know, things that were taken away from you as an artist. What did you learn uh, when, you know, providing the space for people like you, people like me? You know, what did you learn during this journey? Is it easy? Was it easy? Well, well, that's a great question. <laughs> well, I, I have worked for some time in um, the arts as an artist and um, as an art profession. I was directing at a gallery. I was coordinating programs at art museums and whatnot. And after a while, I noticed that there was still such a need for more access and there there was a lack of diversity and it wasn't inclusive. And so that is what led me to um, start iCooey because I wanted a space where I had access <laughs> myself and that other people would have access and that it was diverse. And so um, just to give me little statistics, um, two or three years ago, they did a big like survey uh, research um on um art galleries and art museums and organizations um they found that of uh the staff that's being hired in um these organizations only four percent identify with a disability and then only four percent were black and they looked at the art that was being shown in major um, art museums and galleries. And we found that it was less than 2% that were by black artists. And that's ridiculous. And um, this right here really blew my mind was that black people are the second largest group to pursue an education in the arts. So we're getting degrees in art education, art history, fine arts, painting, whatever. We're the second largest group, but they're not even hiring us. They're not even showing our art at the same rate. So it's, it's, it's imbalanced. <laughs> so I guess a lot of us are um, freelancers. We're starting our own organizations um, or we're changing careers. Um, it's unfortunate, but um, I will say that over the last year and a half, because of the Black Lives Matter and this whole like, uh, you know, movement, um, I have been seeing more art organizations and galleries become more, um, include more Black art. And they're making an effort to hire more Black. Like there's some organizations that have been around for 50 years and they're like, okay, we just hire our first black curator. So I think that we're making some progress and we're moving in the right direction, but it's still, it's still crazy. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like 70 years, just recently, uh, they're just now uh, recognizing uh, black people. But we've been there knocking on the door, asking to, to let us in. You know, we wanted to be involved forever, you know, over 70 ish years, Actually, you know, over 50 years. We've been asking and uh, begging, imploring, knocking on the door to let us in. And they just recently allowed us in. But what you're doing right now, is knocking the hinges off the door 24 seven, welcoming all the people. You're not obstructing anyone.
You know, how are people responding uh, to, uh, you know, when they come to your exhibits or your space? Do they feel like it's home, like a homecoming? Or do they feel lost? Like, I don't know what to do. Or do, you know, do they feel uh, overexcited? You know, how do people feel when they come to your space? I feel like a lot of people feel enlightened. Um, they're in awe. They're like, wow, I didn't know that there was such a thing, you know? And um, even with the book, which I have right here, <laughs> it's the book. <laughs> um, even with the book, uh, people are emailing and they're uh, sending messages on social media. And they're like, wow, I, I feel like, you know, I've been re-educated. Um, and I, I agree that there needs to be more access. There needs to be more inclusivity in the arts. And the other part of it is there's um, just disabled artists who are reaching out and they're like, wow, I can do whatever. You know, I feel encouraged because they're resonating with the stories that are in the book and they're feeling encouraged. So that's just, yeah. Yeah, I, I see that uh, your shirt uh, says care, uh, dear care. What does oh. your shirt say? <laughs> this is actually a shirt for my um, t-shirt line called Dear Black Artists. It's about empowering um, black artists. It says, uh, dear black artists, your dreams matter, your stories matter, your ideas matter, your works matter, and you matter. <laughs> so, yeah, we have a website called dearblackartist.com. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. That t-shirt is beautiful. I want one. I'll send you one. Yes. <laughs> uh, I would like for you to explain how can people get involved with I Aika, I your organization? You know, what does the process look like with the I? Uh, I K O U U. Okay. Well, we have several different ways that people can get involved. Uh, they can volunteer um, with providing access. Uh, we we always need people. <laughs> we always need people to get involved, and so they can um, go online, iQlue.com, and fill out a form. And, you know, they could just tell what they're interested in. And also we do a lot of uh, collaborative projects with other organizations. Um, we're doing a project right now with uh, the Dyer Gallery in New York. And um, previously we've worked at different museums and whatnot. And so we, we, we are always seeking ways to collaborate with other organizations, um, regardless of location. And um, also artists sometimes reach out to, um, collaborate with some of our artists. So that's another option as well. So there's just so many different ways to get involved. I love it. I love it. I want to show a video, but we're going to need your support to explain what the video, what we're seeing in the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> If you can explain uh, what the uh, the title of the video, I think it's it's a short video. Uh, so it looks like an art party. Can you give us a little explanation before we play it? Oh, the yellow, the yellow exhibition. That was a fun, fun event. It was so bright in there. <laughs> um, it was an exhibition where we had artists bring in 
artwork that was made and inspired by the color yellow. <laughs> and we had uh, people um, who were visiting, we told them that if they came in with a yellow outfit, we would give them a free print. And so they just have these beautiful yellow outfits. Oh my goodness, it was just so much fun. And we took a lot of pictures and, um, so yeah, that was one of my favorite uh, events that we've done. And um, we're actually doing it again, but with a different color, blue. <laughs> so that should be interesting as well. Oh, blue, okay. <laughs> I missed the memo. Uh, <laughs> mm, I got the yellow memo. <laughs> Okay, let's watch a little bit of that event. Saw the yellow paint. I did see our people in yellow outfits. I saw yellow food. Yeah. Oh yeah, we had we had a girl come in. She does raw vegan uh, food, and so everything that she brought in was yellow. Uh, there's another video uh, I would like to show. So my understanding is that one person is a dancer. I saw some somebody painting. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that video? Oh, I must forget about that video. <laughs> um, that was actually an example of how we have two very different artists um, collaborate with a project. So one artist, she's from India. And her work is primarily working with turmeric. And then we had another um, artist um, who is a dev dancer. I'm, I'm actually choking a little bit because, I'm choking up a little bit because um, the artist that's a dancer passed away um, a few days ago. Uh, that was in this video. Mm. And he was, he was such a beautiful, uh, person and dancer and actor. And he was such a, a prominent figure here in Atlanta, in the deaf community, disability community. He passed away a couple, uh, a couple of days ago. And, um, that was one of the performances that he did at Iku. Thank <laughs> you. 
the seed and the last one. Beautiful. Yeah, I can see what a beautiful dancer. Spirit was connected to that movement. Community surrounded him. I could definitely see that yellow. That was powerful. So what's uh what's what's coming up with the the blue and and why why the title blue? Well, we're still accepting submissions from artists right now for the blue exhibition, and um, it'll open sometime in late September, and so uh, yeah. Sorry, I was doing the captions. So yeah, um, I'm looking forward to it, and I am just I'm impressed with some of the submissions that we've gotten so far. Your people are really being very innovative and um, just uh, finding new ways to use the color blue. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. It's it's driving our excitement uh, for the next one. Wait, when is it? When is, yeah, when is it? I think September the 25th. 
is when we will um, open the exhibition for Bluish. That's what it's called. Blue I S H. Bluish. Okay. Sounds nice. And I'm still blackish. I'm looking forward to uh, bluish. I might have to come out there and see it. Who's your role model? Who do you look up to? I don't know. I don't think that there is a particular one person. I think that um, it's a collective of different people that have inspired me and whatnot. But I will say personally, as an artist, I've always been a big fan of Ernie Barnes and Elizabeth Catlett. Um, you can see some of the inspiration in my personal work from those two. Who are they? Um, they're both visual artists. Elizabeth Catlett, she was a sculptor. And Erling Barnes, he was a um, professional uh, football player turned uh, painter. And so his, his work is actually uh, it's just beautiful, and it's uh, basically a homage to Black culture, and uh, everything just has so much movement. So that's what um, I resonated with, you know, because I love movement in my art. Beautiful. Wow. My next question may be a little complicated. Uh, how do you identify? Some say uh, an art generalist, a deaf artist, a dancer. How do you identify? I mean, being deaf is a part of me. Um, being an artist is a part of me. Being black is a part of me. It's it's all um, together, you know. And um, it's interesting because I I've, I've had some individuals in the deaf community come up to me and you know just be like, "You're not deaf," <laughs> and um, I actually reached out to my audiologist and I was like. Am I deaf or am I hard of hearing or what? It's just like, according to your hearing test, you are deaf. <laughs> you are profoundly deaf. So um, I've had to deal with that judgment. And I think it's because um, something to do with, you know, that I prefer to use my voice and I feel more empowered and comfortable with using my voice rather than signing. And um I also get some kind of judgment from the hearing world because they'll say, I don't hear a deaf accent. So why are you identifying as deaf? And it's interesting because my mother was a, she's a speech um, and reading specialist. So, that's why I probably speak really well. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that influence, that, that made me more confident to use my voice. And I feel empowered to use my voice because of her um, working with me since I was, you know, two. So I think that it's ridiculous when people uh, judge because you know you're using your voice, uh, I think everybody should be comfortable 
with whatever form of language communication they want to use. And um, I think we all are in this together because we deal with similar challenges. Uh, we all have access issues. And so we shouldn't um, be that way towards each other. <laughs> I know I just got a little heavy for a minute, but I felt like um, I had to say it because I, I had a recent, um, someone reached out to me. They're like, why do you identify as deaf? So that's <laughs> my explanation. You can go ahead and say it. I'm deaf and I'm proud to be deaf. I'm black, I'm deaf, and I'm proud to be it. You are always welcome here. You're going through your own deaf journey experience. You are welcome here. I don't judge you. And I wanna clarify with all people that deaf, I want to clarify to all deaf and hearing people. All because I can speak doesn't mean I have to, if I, I can't hear, so it right. doesn't reflect my ability to speak. And some deaf people can, can speak and articulate clearly, and some can't. Some deaf people can, uh, can speak English. Um, and you know, others, uh, some people can speak Spanish clearly, but their English might be a little broken. It doesn't matter. It can be a challenge. You know how things sound like. So people in the audience, if you're watching, some deaf people can hear birds. Some can hear motorcycles. Some can hear motorcycles. Some can't hear birds. There's no one monolithic deaf person. So like Aletha, you can be like her. You are perfect. Who you are, how you are. I thank you for sharing your voice whether you're signing, whether you're voicing, or whether you're moving. Thank you for sharing that space. Your book is amazing. You know, that book can provide a young person, give them a door to walk through. And some people, it may not, those people may not be too deaf to them. They get the opportunity of somebody being listened to, right? We, it's not about the ear, it's about the heart. Right? You know, I, you know let, the, let them hear you. Yeah, you agree? Right. I agree. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and you're you're picking up ASL, yeah? I am. Yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. How do you feel, you know, learning ASL? Is it something that you're picking up or do you feel like it's tough? Um, I actually have a cousin who's the same age as me and is deaf. And he was teaching me some signs along the way. And so I picked up that way. And then in college, I took an ASL class. And so I could, I could hold a little bit of a conversation but I wasn't comfortable doing a whole interview in sign language. <laughs> I 
was like, mm, That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> we can do the ABCs if you need. <laughs> I can't. I could do my ABCs. I can have a conversation. All so. right, come on. Let's do it. Here we go. Come on. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Oh, <laughs> hold on. Wait a minute. K-L-M-N-O-P-Q-R-S-T-U-V-W-X-Y-Z. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. We're getting close to the end of the uh of the show. So I got a game for you. You ready? Oh. Yeah, here we go. So this next segment of our show is called Name These People. Now, there's two different ways in which you can name them. You can actually name their names or you can kind of describe what they do. For example, maybe the president, a uh, fireman. All right, you ready? Okay. <laughs> okay. See, now you talking my language. <laughs> this is a visual description of a picture of an African-American female appears in her long black bob hairstyle, wears a pair of white pearl stud earrings matching to her white double pearl necklace. Who is she? Michelle Obama, first lady. Ooh, yes, yes. If y'all don't know her, I would have been I'd have been a little scared. I'd been a little scared. Yeah, Michelle Obama from Chica South Side of Chicago. Uh, she is the wife of the forty fourth president. She was on a show called Waffles and Mochi. It's on Netflix. She is a beautiful woman. A visual uh, picture of an African American female wears a tan head wrap on her head with a dark blue lock bangs. She has her four lock jewelries on her long lock bag and blue eyebrows with the long eyelashes. Who is she? I've seen her before. <laughs> um... What do you think she does? If you can't remember her name, is she an actress, a musician? I think she might be an interpreter, but I'm not sure. Mm. Mm. Am I close? close. Ah! <laughs> okay. Yeah, she's an ASL performer. Not like an interpreter, but a performer. Her name's Raven Sutton. She's out from Alabama. She's a dancer, a cell performer, deaf awareness advocate. She was on our show, I think, two weeks ago. She's an inc she's amazing. She's just less loose. Awesome. Visual description, a picture of an African-American male appears in his black, white text, New York baseball cap, wearing an aqua blue eyes framed eyeglasses. Who is he? He's a filmmaker. <laughs> oh, his, why am I not taking his name? his name right now? But I know he's a filmmaker. He's done a lot of films. Uh, well, he'll come name, <laughs> name one of his movies. I'm drawing a blank. I know his movies. <laughs> oh, Spigley. <laughs> oh, yeah. Spigley. Spigley. Yeah, you know he's from Atlanta, Georgia. And he moved to New York. He's an American film director, producer, screenwriter, actor, and professor. 
I think he's made over 35 uh, films. Uh, Spike is his nickname is Spike. This this next one is a cool, cool, cool person. He's deaf. As a picture, African American male sits crossing his arms with long block locks flowing over his shoulders, wears a light teal blue opening button blouse, and grins at the camera. Who is he? Ah. Uh. His name's Mervin O'Brien. Deaf, uh, native of New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, dancer, actor, choreographer. He's a beautiful human. Right now he's in New York. He's uh, he's involved in all kinds of uh, activities in New York. Uh, I hope you get the opportunity to meet this amazing person. Now he's, and he's also my good friend. A visual picture of an African-American female appears in the background of silver trees, several trees, standing with her right hand on her right hip while smiles at the camera. Who is she? I have no idea. Her, na her name's Catherine Ramen Stefan. She's an educator, a yoga teacher, and several others. She also wrote a book. Oh, wow. Okay. I hope y'all connect. Uh, she was on uh, an, ep an earlier episode of Deaf Woke. Uh, <laughs> picture, a picture of African-American man uh, as has a tiny gray hair to almost hairless, a thin trimmed gray goatee, wears a pair of silver framed eyeglasses to match to his fine black suit jacket with a blue collar and a light blue navy spotted tie, looking so sharp as he glances away from the camera. Who is he? He looks like the president of the, the Deaf Black Association or something. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got it. Dr. Glenn Anderson. <laughs> He's the one of the founders of the National uh, Black Deaf Advocates. He has, he's the first deaf male to receive a PhD from the Gallaudet University, uh, Washington, DC. A visual <laughs> description, a picture of an African-American female sits in the back of a wheelchair facing to the camera, wearing in a bright arm pink dress. She wears in a blue long black curly twisted hairstyle, posing in a dance with her hands that touch on the hands at its back. One right leg stretching out with a foot touched on her gray floor. She smiles at the camera. Who is she? I'm sorry, the captures went off. Oh. Who is she? Hold on. The captures went off. I can get him back on. <laughs> I know her. She is an Aikui artist, actually. India Harville, I think it is. India Harville. She's one of uh, our members. Ah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. India Harville. The captions are still not working. She's from the Bay Area in California. Mm -hmm. a disabled queer femme teacher, somatic uh, body worker, performer, artist, dancer, instructor, social justice advocate, uh, and educator. Uh, she's one of only 25 people who are advanced certification in dance ability to become a ma master instructor. Um, 
I are they know cashier? of him. I remember. Is a, a visual picture of an African American male appears in his black jacket, white collar, and a light brown tee, wears in a black flat haircut neatly and black full trimmed beard. Looking at the camera, looking so serious. Who is he? I cannot recall. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> okay. He's a cool guy named J.C. Smith. Uh, is a football star and a black student union leader at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. He's a cool, cool, cool guy. We're getting oh. a visual uh, description, a picture of an African-American female appears in her background of a green and pink flowery plant pants from outside. She has a black curly hair in one side on the left, wearing a pair of black cat framed eyeglasses. Who is she? I believe she's probably a speaker. speaker or disability advocate of some sort just not sure what her name is mm -hmm. well you are on the nose andrea lavant uh, a native of tempe arizona is the president chief inclusion uh officer Office of Levant Counseling Incorporated. Through Levant Counseling, Andrea teaches brands ways to create disability inclusive marketing campaigns. She is impact producer and Oscar nominated 2020 documentary called Crip Camp. Hey, okay. Visual dis uh, picture of a African American female appears in her red lace dress with no sleeves, wearing a white pearl stud earring. She has a long black hair over her shoulders. She glances to the left at the camera, smiling a little bit. Who is she? She is the first deaf blind lawyer, I believe. What is her name? What is her name? Her name is not covered to me, but I know she is the first deaf blind lawyer. She went to Yale, I believe. She has a book that's amazing. That's close. The college is close. Remember her name? Ah. Yeah, Habian Gurma. You got it. You're right. You're right there. She's deaf blind. Uh, she's an author. Uh, graduated from Harvard Law School. She re was recognized to be an award by the President Barack Obama who has named her the White House Champion of Change. What? She has a book called Habian, the Deafblind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law. This one might be a little, a little challenging, but the visual description, a picture of an African-American female appears in her honey short curly hairstyle, wears a dark gray blouse with a short necklace of diamonds matching to her pair of diamond stud earrings, smiles at the camera. Who is she? What do you think she, what do you think she does? News hosting. <laughs> That's my, my best guess. This is Claudia L. Gordon. She's a native of Jamaica. Is the first black, first deaf black female attorney in the United States. She's been active in both black deaf community and the disability community. Uh, Claudia uh, has become the first deaf person to work at the White House. 
uh, for a few years uh, while during the Barack Obama's presidency. She is an incredible person. I hope you get the opportunity of meeting her. All right, last one. A picture of African-American male sits putting his hand on his left cheek and dimples smiling at the camera. He has a deeply gray sunny hat with strings, wears a blue shirt with a pair of gray shorts and a black and brown <laughs> beaded bracelet on his right hand and wrist. Who is he? He's a dancer. Yeah. Close. And and he actually doesn't live too far from, from me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't remember his name, but if I saw him right now, I would be like, okay, I know him. So, but yeah, he's a dancer. Uh, he's done a lot of videos uh, where he, you know, does songs in ASL, and um, he was he was really big on ASL for hip hop music. Um, he's done a lot of music videos. Can't remember his name. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> right, Matt Maxi, native of Atlanta, Georgia. You're both from Georgia. Is known as uh, definitely dope. Uh, that name, definitely dope, is a brand to help merge the gap between the hearing and deaf worlds, and later evolved to a platform. So good job, good job. <laughs> yeah. I know time is running out. I don't want to be greedy. So I want to allow the audience uh, to pose some questions. So this segment of the show is Ask Aletha Anything. So I'll go ahead and read some of these questions. Oh, can you remind us what your three degrees are in? Um, fine arts, creative art therapy, and creative business design and leadership. <laughs> Hi, Alita. I'm so new to Equi. Hope I spell it right. Are you offering uh, deaf BIPOC college students to take an internship to work at Equi? Absolutely. Absolutely. They could just go on our website and fill out a form and we'll uh, get in contact and do an interview. Will you ever go back to dance? I don't know. I, I kind of miss it. It's been um it's been 10 years since I had my last professional dance performance. And it's it's a funny story actually because my friend had came over to my place in New York. I was living in New York at the time. And she saw in the newspaper that they were doing auditions for Aida. And um, she dared me to go and audition. And it was the very next day. And she went with me. And so I went to the audition. I had so much fun. I love the people and I love the choreography. And I didn't think anything of it. So I, I just went on about my business. And a few days later, they contacted me and said, you've been casted. <laughs> Yeah. So I ended up, yeah, so that was exciting. That was a cool, very cool experience to be on Broadway. It just, you know, I was working two full-time jobs at the time. A day job, an overnight job from 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. So I don't even know how, how I managed to go to my rehearsals and do the performances, but it was, it was really fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Do you have any new projects in the near future that will challenge you? Um, every project has its own set of challenges. And um, I always take away something from each project. Uh, I think the next like biggest challenging thing, if I were to say something was challenging, would be at IQ, we were trying to do a um, artist residency program. And, you know, I'm very um, adamant to make sure that it's fully accessible and that artists from all over the world can come and uh, stay somewhere for a short period of time and to make sure that that's accessible and to make sure that we have enough funding and all of that. So I think that's that's the next like big, like if you want to say challenging project. Yes. Will you be writing your own book at any time, like an autobiography? <laughs> I'm actually already writing a book. Um, it's actually about my experience as a deaf artist in Morocco. And I let me tell you, it's, it was so many crazy adventures that happened there during my time there. And um, the very first day that I arrived in Morocco, I ran into another deaf woman. Uh, and she started signing in um, Moroccan Sign Language. And I responded in American Sign Language. And we understood each other. We ended up talking and uh, chatting for about an hour in the middle of the street. <laughs> so I, it's just different things that happen during my time there that I want to share. And so, yeah, that book, I'm working on that. Yes, yes, yes. I love everything that you're doing. Do you have something important? You know, your last word, your last thought that you want to share with the audience? Hmm. Huh. Just... Be yourself and pursue the things that make you happy. That's that's the, uh, I guess that's my life mantra. <laughs> All right, people. Uh, you can follow Aletha Lindsay on her website and social media uh, at HTTPS colon slash I K O U I I dot com or or at I G at I K O U I I. Please follow, follow, follow. Don't be afraid to connect with Alita. Yes. She's an amazing absolutely. individual. Thank you so much for coming. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really love this platform that you have. It's amazing. And so I'm glad to uh, have had the opportunity to be here and uh, just share the deaf walk. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you at Bluish. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Wow, that was great. Alita, Lindsay, an incredible human. Did y'all enjoy yourselves?
I know I did. I want to say thank you to everyone who's in attendance today. You know, my final thought, you know, going to college, maybe you set up a plan and you were like, you know what, I want this degree. But, but the idea and the path changes. You transition to a different degree. And then you're on that track and you change and you develop something new and you get involved in something else. All of that is something worthy to give back to the community. It develops strength, advocacy. Oh, you know, the story of being deaf that you can't do something, you know, just watch me. I encourage you to tell me I can't do something. I'm gonna show you. So the truth is, you are beautiful. You are smart. You are strong. You are incredible. I wanna say thank you to all of the people, all, everyone who is in attendance today. Thank you to Aletha Lindsay. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you all. We can't forget about our captionist this evening, Miss Diana. Thank you so much. Such she's loyal she, and her hands were on fire. So thank you for to our audience. Thank you to How Round, Drop Labs, and you, you who are watching. Where are my likes at? Come on, where are my likes at? Let me see them clicks. Click, 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 click. Come on. Come on, let me get those hearts. Come on, give me the hearts. Give me the hearts. Uh, what about this shirt? Uh, thank you to Popfish for this shirt. You know, we want this platform to keep going. We want Deaf Woke to last. So if, you have, if you're capable of, of donating um, at Real Urban Jazz Dance Company, uh, please contact us. Uh, the show operating costs are not free. Um, and so we want, you know, we want to support our community, provide access to all people. Uh, it's not easy. Um, it's not free. So we need your help. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Mm-hmm. Yes, keep striving, yes. Okay, so I hope y'all get the opportunity of connecting. Uh, I am Antoine Hunter, also known as Purple Fire Crow. Thank you for watching. Deaf, woke. Peace, love, I'm out. Man, well, hold on, let me get that music so we get a little grooving going on. Where's my music at? Come on, where's it at? <laughs> Thank you.